Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, first event of the Green Homes Festival. Uh, my name is Emma Church. I'm an impact manager at Built Environment Smarter Transformation, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Um, hello to everybody online and to those in the room in the RICS uh, boardroom. Um, so today um, we're going to hear about protecting your property from flooding and its impact. Um, we have uh, speakers from SEPA. Uh, Gail Donald is a SEPA flood advisor, and they will also be hearing from Kirsty McRae from the Scottish Flood Forum. Um, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this session will be recorded and will be available to view on the YouTube channel early next week. If you would like to ask any questions or leave any comments um, for our speakers, um, you can click on the questions section in the control panel, type in your question and press send. There will be a few poll questions running throughout the, the webinar. These will appear automatically on your screen and you'll have about 30 seconds to answer. Um, these are just sort of general opinion gathering uh, for us um, to sort of keep you guys involved. And your feedback is really, really valuable. Um, so all questions and comments on board about how the event has run today, even if we don't have time to answer everything, uh, we will follow up with, with different questions and uh, any of your comments or queries. Um, so, absolutely um, excited to, to get started today. Um, first of all, um, a little bit of an introduction uh, from myself about um, the, the topic of, of flooding um, and who we are at Built Environment Smarter Transformation. So, as I mentioned, uh, my name is Emma Church. I'm an impact manager within the sustainability team. Um, who are Built Environment Smarter Transformation? We are a public funded organisation. Can you just flip your screen again? So just display settings. Oh, thank, and you. thank you. Sorry about Perfect. that. Thank you. Issues. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, sorry. Um, we are a public funded organisation to um, support the built environment in the transition to zero carbon. Obviously, you may have heard that the UK and the Scottish government policy has set out um, that we are reach net zero by 2050 um, in the UK and 2045 in Scotland. In order to achieve this, all sectors must decarbonise. So in the energy sector, it's about using more renewables, uh, solar technology, wind turbines, um, use of heat pumps um, in our homes and in our businesses and in public buildings, and ultimately using less fossil fuels, so uh, less oil and uh, less gas. In the transport sector, that means the transition um, to using electric vehicles and again away from fossil fuels, petrol and diesel vehicles. Materials, ultimately we're looking at reducing how much materials that we use, um, reusing what materials we already have and when those have uh, end, end of reached their end of life, recycling those materials and, and trying to get as much value from those um, as possible. And in the built environment, um, we are trying to support organisations um, to develop technologies um, and services and products that will help them decarbonise. So why is zero carbon the goal? Um, like I said, we're talking about new products, new services, processes and technologies um, that are needed in order to, um, sorry, in order to achieve uh, zero carbon and have these materials um, used more commonly. These innovations and changes on how we use energy and materials are all about reducing our carbon footprint. And reducing carbon and, and the carbon intensity of what we do and how we live um, is essential to mitigating the effects of climate change. And what climate change means is, is more severe and more frequent extreme weather events and, and sort of general global um, warming, which leads to rising sea levels. They also affect um, lots of our environment and our habitat. Um, and that can lead to things like food scarcity because the conditions for, for growing um, you know, crops and, and keeping livestock in these um, environments becomes more challenging. Specifically in the built environment, the scale of the challenge is huge. Um, the built environment includes not just our homes and, and where we live, but our schools, hospitals, shops, offices, all of the buildings that, that make up our, our infrastructure and all of the roads um, and the transport links and how these buildings are, are connected all makes up part of um, of the built environment sector so we have to be looking at, at materials and energy use uh, um, across all of these sectors 
So at Built Environment Transformation, uh, Smarter Transformation, we sit in the middle um, between industry who are potentially creating um, new products and processes and services um, to put them in touch with academia, um, academics in our university sector who are also working on, on um, solving some of those challenges and also um, those in the public sector. So our decision makers and our policy makers and um, helping them understand where the challenges and where the opportunities exist in industry. And so we, we sit right in the middle of, of those um, three sectors and try to bring them together to come up with solutions um, for, like I say, the challenges of, of decarbonizing our built environment. And how we do that is, is about um, making connections um, encouraging uh, collaboration to create projects and support projects and find funding for projects that will give us the answers to some of these challenges and we can do that in our innovation factory so um, just outside uh, Hamilton we have a, an innovation factory where industry can come along and test out their ideas or, and use um, different products um, and technologies available um, through uh, funding through our supportive organisations um, to be able to access those and develop new, new technologies. And then also through our communications, um, our events like those today, you know, sharing widely as possible our, um, our work and you know, mainstreaming and, and helping people understand how they can get involved and how they can have an impact um, on their own built environment. So thank you very much. Um, I will be passing over now um, to our next speaker. Um, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. So we have a poll up next, I beg your pardon. Um, so we are talking about flood risk today. Um, so have you checked um, whether you're the area where you live and or work um, is at risk of flooding? Um, that's our kind of initial question, our starter question. Um, if you have a few seconds left to, to answer that, it'd be really appreciative. So a few more seconds there to answer that. Lovely. Okay, excellent. So actually, I was quite surprised about that. Um, yeah, so um, sort of more than about two thirds um, of our audience today have actually checked whether they're um, at risk of flooding. Um, we will hear a little bit more um, from our next speakers about um, what you can do with the results of that, you know, if you are at risk of flooding. Um, and for those of you who haven't, um, there will be information um, and links in the chat box um, that will allow you to, to figure out how you can do that. So next up, um, I'm very, very pleased to um, introduce Gail Donald, a SEPA flood advisor. Um, SEPA, for those of you who don't know, is the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, um, which has resources for flood risk um, identification. Gail uh, Donald is the flood advisor for the southeast of Scotland, and she's worked with SEPA for 12 years. Um, and there is, uh, SEPA provides national flood forecasting, warning and strategic flood risk management. Um, Gail's role uh, is all about supporting and advising communities, partner organisations, businesses and members of the public about these flood services and share understanding and best practice to help Scotland reduce the impacts of flooding. So I will be happy to pass you over um, to Gail um, to hear more. Hi everybody, um, thank you very much Emma for, for that information. Um, just sort of linking in to what we're going to talk about today, um, as you can see from the, the first slide here, um, protecting properties from flooding and its impacts can be done in a, a, a range of ways. Um, and if we can plan and make changes before flooding happens, then hopefully that actually can mean we reduce the amount of resources that we use um, because if we're making changes to home improvements or um, making building new homes and making them adaptable and resilient, then we'll actually be using resources more wisely for, for the future. So bringing in that, that net carbon. Uh, next slide. Um, so flooding in Scotland is something that we see increasingly often. Um, flooding from stating impact um, it can bring down buildings um, but flooding also occur, occurs from the sea and has impacts and this last photograph is actually 
this property that um, fr flooded um, is not near a river, it's not near a burn, it's not near the sea, and it flooded as a result of flash flooding. Heavy rainfall in an isolated area in a city, the water basically um, rooted itself down. Um, this person actually wasn't at the bottom of a hill, they just happened to be at a point where the water found the easiest route to get in. It actually burst down the door um, and the depth of water in that property was over one and a half metres. The fire service themselves said to the property owner, you're lucky you weren't actually sleeping when this happened, as we're not sure you would have made it out with the force of water that was coming down. So flooding can have a serious impact. Um, the, the person in that property was actually out of their property for over a year and, co and the damages actually cost ran into almost £100,000 worth of damage. Um, next slide. So flooding impacts, we've seen water in properties and we've seen the fact that people's belongings and um, items that are in their house can be uh, damaged and removed. But sometimes the, the actual scale of the damage within inside a building isn't always seen. We've seen the photographs from outside where people have left the stuff, but this photograph is taken inside a property that received flooding. And it, I think it always amazes me just how much dirt and uh, debris there is. It's not just uh, the water is not clean. So it, it does require a lot of um, clean up and removing of silt and rubbish and twigs, as you can see there. Um, but also the damages to people's um, homes means that they can be out for a significant amount of time um, and it has emotional and um, anxiety impacts on, on, on people as well. How can we reduce the impacts of flooding, being at risk of flooding and taking appropriate action before flooding happens is one of the things that we can do and this might be thinking about when we're making changes, if you're doing renovations or building a new property, is making that resilience to, resilient to flooding. Um, next slide. Um, just to understand the scale of flooding uh, risk in Scotland, there's 280,000 homes and businesses currently at risk. With climate change, that actually adds another 110,000 properties um, businesses um, and what does those numbers mean in context so currently one in 11 homes is at risk of Scotland um, risk at flooding and one in seven businesses with climate change that actually increases so that the it's only one in nine homes that will be at risk and one in six businesses so the risk is increasing next slide um, when we talk about climate change what are we talking about? What are the predictions for Scotland? We're looking at wetter, warmer winters. That means possibly less snow. So sometimes as a flood duty officer, if there's snow, that actually can help a flooding situation if, if water is locked away in a frozen form for it to melt gradually. However, we've all experienced sudden snow melt and that can cause flooding. More thunderstorms in the summer. Um, mean that at the moment if we had a rainfall a thunderstorm the ground is so hard water will just run off it all what all land at the moment will act just like concrete it's solid water won't gradually soak into that so runoff can be a real problem and sea level rise means that our coastal communities are going to be at greater risk of flooding the risk of flooding in the future is higher and we need to adapt to learn to live with water. We need to adapt our homes and our businesses and so that we live with the water that will be around. Uh, next slide. Um, in SEPA, we've got a few tools that are there and I was greatly surprised and it's really good to see that a lot of people have checked their flood risk. and. Um, our flood risk service is available on our website. Um, you just click the link there to check your flood risk. You can either check out a site by just looking at the map um, and um, or you can enter a postcode and a postcode will give you a summary of the risk within 50 metres 
of that building. It's a, an assessment of the area that's at risk. It's not an individual property assessment. Um, the postcode I entered for this is actually one of our SEPA offices. And you can see there it says that there's a high risk of surface water flooding and that there's a medium risk to, to river. When you look at the map for the river risk, um, it will show, um, if you can just click a couple of times, the map will show you what we're expecting is the risk. And, and this is quite useful to understand our flood maps. So the dark blue area is that area that's highest risk. The sort of sky blue color there is um, the, the area that's at medium risk and the light lighter shade is actually low risk. And you can see there that where the building is, um, is actually in a low risk, but just over the road or just um, is, is at medium risk, which is why when we did this, it picked it up being at medium risk. Why is that one block they are showing in light blue? You might be thinking, well, that looks a little bit of an anomaly. That's actually, there's community um, protection in that area. And there is um, a flood protection um, embankment or wall that has been put in by the local authority. So the risk in that area is slightly lower than on the other side of the embankment. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the, the other thing is, is if you are at risk of flooding and knowing your risk, then actually if you're making um, flood um, adaptions or if you're looking at protecting your property, knowing when flooding is going to happen is an important step and important information. And in May this year, SEPA launched um, its three-day public flood outlook. Um, it's the Scottish, floor Scottish flood forecast and that forecast is provided um, as a service by SEPA free. It's on our website um, and in partnership with the Met Office. Um, I took this um, slide last week when we were forecasting some heavy sort of thundery showers in the sort of Dundee and Tayside area to highlight what the map would show um, when we, we are expecting some form of flooding. Um, and these, at the moment, the Scottish flood forecast is a new test product. So any if you use it and if you look at it and want to provide us feedback, all that feedback will be very useful for us to build a better service for the future. Um, our flood warning service within SEPA, uh, we've provided direct warnings to the public for um, over 10 years now. Um, next slide. Um, and that, that direct warning service includes flood alerts, which are regional wide flood messages that tell an area that there's a threat of flooding um, or possibility of flooding and it will we issue those flood alerts for all sources of flooding, surface water, river and coastal. We have more specific community focused flood warning messages in, in um, over 320 locations currently um, across across Scotland and that's where we can provide a specific flood warning for um, rivers or the sea. Um, we have um, a number of warnings that are available. It's all free of charge. You can get sent a telephone message or a text message direct to your mobile phone so that you can take action. Some of those might be as fitting property level protection that Kirsty is going to come on to talk about. That map is a location of all the communities where we currently provide a direct warning service from either the sea or a river. Um, you can always get more information and you can register either online or on our website. Um, Floodline is a joint partnership across the whole of the UK, um, providing flooding information and advice um, 24 hours a day, every day. Um, and that information can be is always replicated on SEPA's website. Um, next slide please. So just thinking about flooding, knowing when it can happen and knowing that you're at risk can help. So there are other steps that you can take and some of those steps can just be in checking your insurance to make sure that you're insured and making a plan and making a plan about 
if you are flooded, what would you do and actions that you can take? Um, thinking about property resilience before flooding happen can minimise the damage um, and home improvements are opportunities to adapt our homes to our changing climate. Um, thank you very much. And I will pass you on to Kirsty. Hi there. Thank you very much, Gail. That was that was really, really insightful. And um, for those of you who are um, joining us online, you're able to see in the chat box um, some of those links um, to the, the flood uh, advisory service and, and to CFA's website and to those different um, forecasts and updates um, available online. Um, just before we move on to, to Kirsty's presentation, uh, we do have another quick poll. So um, now that you've heard from, from Gail at SIPA, um, on a scale of one to five, how likely are you now to check your flood risk? Um, even if you have um, done it before, you know, um, with, with climate change and, and how things have, have changed and maybe seeking out where the uh, new defences and things like that may have been implemented, um, you know, it might be worth going and having another look to see um, uh, if you can find out your, your flood risk. Um, and also, you've obviously got an opportunity there to... Oh, excellent. So most of you are going to go away um, and take an action to, to check on your flood risk and then hopefully register for some of those alerts um, if, if the results are that you or your home, your property or your business um, is at risk. Which is great. Thank you very much. So yes, we will be um, hearing now from, from Kirsty who can give some additional advice um, from the Scottish Flood Forum um, on what you can do to, to mitigate the risks of, of flooding impacts on your home. So um, yeah, Kirsty's going to speak on flood resilience. Um, she's worked with the Flood Forum for over nine years and is currently coordinating the Scottish Property, uh, Property Flood Resilience Delivery Group, which is a group made up of a dif different organisations which aim to raise awareness and mainstream these measures that can be taken to stop water entering properties in the event of flooding, which are called resistance measures, or that can heat, help speed up the drying out and reinstatement of a building after flooding. Um, so yes, I'll pass you over to Kirsty now um, to find out more about um, flood risk resilience. Thank you, Emma. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so as Emma's already said, I work for the Scottish Flood Forum. So before I move into the detail of the uh, talk, I just wanted to give you a little bit of update of what the Scottish Flood Forum does. So if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So we're a small charity that work across Scotland and we work with communities that are at risk of flooding or who have experienced flooding to help them prepare, but also to help them recover. So that can be a mixture of setting up um, community resilience groups so that a community can come together to, to support each other and become more resilient to flooding uh, and also work with individuals and communities as they go through the journey of recovering after a flood event. A lot of what we do is awareness raising, both of the risks of flooding uh, to help communities understand that this is a risk that they, they face uh, and also what they can do, uh, some of which Gail's already mentioned in her talk. If you are at risk, there are certain actions you can take, such as signing up to flood warnings. Uh, and one of the key things or, uh, individuals and communities can do is to think about property flood resilience. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. So if I could have the next slide, please. So what is property flood resilience? Um, resilience is two, made of two things. One is resistance actions, um, which keeps the water out of properties. And the other are resilience or recoverability options. These are the things that can lessen the, the damage. Why does this matter? Well, a lot of what we've heard about already from uh, both Gail and Emma with the changes to our climate and with the increase in climate change gives you a really strong reason and motivator to take these actions to, to, protect, to protect your properties. However, there's a wider issue here too, and this impacts the net zero and carbon neutral agenda, which most of the festival or much of this festival will be focused on. If every time a property floods, floorboards are ripped out, plasterboard is replaced, insulation is replaced, then that's a huge carbon load going to landfill. When properties are retrofitted after a flood event, so being put back together, or being retrofitted for energy efficiency, 
How sad if a flood a year or five years down the line means that much of that work is ripped out and goes to landfill again. There all are already known solutions. That means that properties can be made more resilient to flooding, even existing housing stock. So let's make sure these are solutions and are, are integrated wherever possible. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about two things, um, resistance and recoverability, and why both matter, and then leave you some wider context and info on work that's going on at the moment and how you can find out more. So how does water, flood water enter a property? Sometimes it's the simple things that I forget. Certainly I'm talking for myself. Flood water or any water will find the path of least resistance. And getting into a home is sometimes due to slack of simple maintenance or poor workmanship. It's easy to resolve, but only if you know where to look. Water will always find the easiest route. If there's poor pointing or cracked mortar, that's how water is going to get in. So just be aware of maintaining your property. And I'm speaking to myself here. Um, another very simple route through which we see time and time again, sadly, is cable entry points. If your sky engineer, other providers exist, uh, or your electrician are putting cables into your house, make sure they make the hole watertight afterwards. We've seen in the recent last 12 months, really sad stories where people have put in measures, they put in air brick covers, they put in all the things I'm going to talk about later, thinking my property is protected, but they haven't realised there's a huge big hole in the wall where cables are coming through and water is initially seeped and then began to flood into their property that they thought was protected. Just be aware when you haven't worked on, think how could water get in. As well as these really simple maintenance steps, there are a number of products you can install and measures you can take. Next slide, please. So this is a very busy slide and it shows the range of things you can do both to keep water out and also to lessen the damage if water does get in. I'm going to take both in turn, but just in summary, the things circled in blue are the resistance measures, the things you can do to keep water out. All the rest, and they are the majority, are things you can do, some of which are just mindset and, and, and being prepared, behaviour change things. Others are measures you can put in place so that your house is better prepared if water were to get in. I'll take both in turn. Next slide, please. So resistance measures, these are the things that keep water out. You can see some of the photographs here. One really easy solution or part of solution is air brick covers. Um, all of our air bricks, by definition, are low to the ground, close to the ground, and even quite shallow thunderstorm rain that Gail was talking about is becoming more and more prevalent, can get in just at that low level. You can get covers that you just put on manually if there's a flood risk um, warning out. You can put these covers on, which just stops water getting in. Or the next stage up is you can retrofit and replace your air bricks with automatic ones, which have got a little valve in. So although they let air travel, as soon as there's a pressure of water from outside, uh, it stops water getting in. And that can be a really cost effective way of just keeping that low level water out of your property. There's also um, barriers. Both You can see a gentleman there standing with a door barrier in his door, which he's manually placed in 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 position when he thinks there's a flood warning. You can also, a larger investment, but you can get flood doors that are there the whole time, um, which will keep water out of your property up to a certain depth. Um, a good Google search will certainly take you to an awful lot of measures that you can buy just, just online. Although we would always advise that a property owner gets a survey or at least assessment of the home if you're considering getting uh, products, just to make sure those products are suitable for the property type, for the flood risk type, and for the owner, the occupier, to make sure that they're, they're, they're appropriate, that they're not too heavy for you or, or too difficult to, to install. So we'd always advise you, you take advice before you, you buy, but they are all available uh, on online and in many stores. Uh, the links that I believe will be in the chat function, I would take you to two places on our website. One is which has got a little guide, which again, just gives you some more information about the kind of things you can buy. And the other is a tool which you can put in details about your own property and get a feel for how much it might cost you if you were to do some of these things. So they'll be in the, the chat function later. Uh, next slide, please. So recoverability measures, even if somebody has installed all the measures I mentioned before, some water is likely to get in, especially if flood water is sitting around your property for many hours or many days. Some will seep in or they may be overtopping, getting over the top of those barriers. But 
it's still worth doing because you'll have more time to prepare uh, and move things. Uh, you will also, it's often easier to clean out because the water doesn't get in for as long or as deep and there's less silt and mud involved. And you saw the slide that Gail shared with us of the amount of damage, just the mud and the remnants of, of that water can leave in your home. So PLP is always worth it, even if some water does get in. But recoverability measures are also needed. Some of these are a mindset or a planning thing, such as be ready to move valuables upstairs or onto high uh, surfaces like a top of a, uh, a bookcase. Seems easy, but if you're panicking, if you're suddenly in a, oh, flip, I'm going to flood, what do I do? If you've thought about it in advance, it's so much easier if you've got a few bullet points on your phone of, right, these are the things, these are where my photos are, I want to take them upstairs. This, this is where my, my paper insurance documents are, the low level, I want to make sure the higher level. Invest in a puddle pump or a wet dry vacuum. That means if any water just starts seeping in through the door or you're just getting very low levels of water, you can you can soak it up before it does any damage. Soaking, soaking it up being a technical term. Rugs, not carpets. If you know you're in a flood risk area, think about having rugs. You can roll them up and move them rather than fitted carpets. So they're the easy things. There are other longer term measures you can put in place, which to be honest, you'd only really do if you are renovating your property after a flood or if you are undertaking home improvements. But it's worth being aware of them because if you are ever doing home imp improvements, you can think, how can I use, do this in a way that's flood resilient? That can be as simple as raising your electrics. One of the biggest disruptors we see when somebody's been flooded is even if it's quite shallow water, if your electrics are got wet, it needs to be ripped out and electrics be put back in. That can be a huge cost and disruption. If your electrics, when you're doing work anyway, are raised a meter or more above the ground and also your fuse box is raised, it just mean if you do flood or if some water gets in, that level of disruption is not required. That can be a really simple win at the right time. Similarly, have a think about your flooring. If you've got wooden floorboards and you're in a flood risk area, when you're replacing them, Think about concrete, talk to your suppliers or your surveyors or your, your builder. What options would mean that if water got in, I could just sweep it out, dry it out and get on with life. It can make a huge, huge difference. Um, insulation, if you're putting insulation in, think about closed cell insulation because it will dry out or is much more likely to dry out if it gets damp uh, rather than just wick the water up and you have to replace the whole lot. There's a whole heap of these measures which are, if you know to ask, your, your builders and your, your surveyors will be able to, to uh, consider. And one of the biggest disruptors which can cause people to be out of their home for a very long time and a huge cost is your kitchen. Um, again, when you're replacing your kitchen, either because of flooding or for your own reasons, um, think about a kitchen that the materials of those cabinets, metal used to be the only thing we could offer um, if, if it was um, in a flood risk area. There were some actually really nice metal kitchens, plastic kitchens, solid wood it actually dries out really well. And a few just simple tricks like putting your white goods on a plinth, on a concrete plinth, so they're just a few inches off the ground, can just make a huge difference. So there are a number of things we can do to make our homes easier to dry out if and when flooding happens. So next next slide, please. <clears throat> so why does all this matter? matter? Gail's talked about some of this and I flagged some of it, but just to go into a little bit more detail. Uh, next slide, please. This is an excerpt from an Association of British Insurers document that they send out to people after they're flooded so that they know what to expect and what to prepare for. And I'd just like to draw your attention to the little box in red. Moving back into your home, even the a ABI um, are saying it will often take between six months and a year to get back into your home after flooding. Our experience as the SFF is that it can often be more. We've had people out 18 months, partly because of problems getting dehumidifiers in to dry their property before even the work can start. But it can take a very long time. That's a huge level of disruption and the emotional impact of being out your home in temporary accommodation, possibly quite a long way from your community and from your family, because if your whole community is flooded, everybody's looking for temporary accommodation. Um, you, it can be a huge emotional and mental cost to you and your family to do that. And that's if you are insured. If you're not insured, on top of the emotional and, and uh, em yeah, mental cost, is also the actual uh, financial cost of time and disruption. 
or the long-term impact of living in a property that, to be honest, isn't fit for human habitation. And we have some really sad experiences of that happening as well. So PFR really matters from so many angles, financial, emotional, mental. Uh, next slide, please. These stats are a little bit out of date. This was a number of years ago, but we undertook a survey of a community that had been flooded um, and asked what were the main causes of stress as you go through this process. And you'll see there that 44% of people said accommodation, not being in my own home, being in temporary accommodation was the biggest source of stress. Again, PFR, property flood resilience, can lessen the amount of time that people are out of their homes and therefore lessen that stress. Next slide. Uh, so sources of more information. Next slide. Sorry, that was just a, an overview. I'm going to give you a little bit more detail now. So I've covered a lot of ground in terms of detail, and I wanted to give you some wider context just so you're aware and can and ask good questions if you're having any work done or if you're more interested in knowing more. There's a great deal of work going on both at UK level and Scotland level to create a more level playing field and to professionalise the industry and to bring PFR more into the mainstream of just the normal. This is how we do things. There's a code of practice on property flood resilience, which covers the whole process from assessing a property's flood risk to surveying the property's construction and advising on measures and to installing and maintaining these measures. This code of practice is voluntary. But the industry and, and all players, the kind of the, the um, community of flood risk is looking to mainstream the code of practice. And hot off the press, there is now training available that will bring surveyors, insurance companies um, or insurance surveyors uh, and builders to a level of being accredited in PFR um, so that all installers and surveyors involved in PFR are accredited and we as consumers can start asking have you undertaken accreditation training? So this is coming, it's on its way, we're not there yet, but we're, we're moving towards a much more professionalised industry. Uh, as homeowners, it's worth being aware of this because the aim is that we don't need to be experts, but if you're aware of it, you can ask your surveyors, you can ask your insurance companies, what can I do? And are you aware of, of this training? And finally, there's a new scheme just launched in, I think it was April this year by Flood Ray, whereby home, home owners can access an insurance policy that in the event of a flood will include a payout which will enable Build Back Better fl um, property flood resilience to be included in the rebuild rather than just putting back like for like. It's going to take time for this uh, new policy to feed into the market, um, but over time it should increase both the number of surveyors and builders trained in and aware of PFR and the number of homeowners who can afford after a flood to make their homes more resilient. If this is of interest, next time you're renewing your policy, talk to your insurer about whether they offer flood rate, which is the, the organisation that backs these policies, or build back better policies. The more we as consumers put for the push for this, the more it's going to become the norm. So um, again, the links will be in the chat function for you to find out more. Uh, next slide, please. So before I end, I'd like to put a face to some of these things. Paul and his family, and uh, we're going to see a wee video, were in temporary accommodation for 15 months following their first flood. Since then, they've installed a number of property flood resilience measures in the homes, including a flood door, extra pumps, ray sockets, hardwood skirting boards, and porcelain tiles, many of those measures I was mentioning. So they were prepared when they flooded again in February this year. You'll also hear Paul mention the impact a Build Back Better insurance policy could have had had they been available. So let's just hear from Paul on the differences between the two floods. Hi Kirsty, I'm afraid we're not getting sound on this video for everyone. So what I'll do is in the follow up email for you all, I'll just share the YouTube link and you can watch it there. Apologies. 
That's fine. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you to watch that. It's only a minute and a half, two minutes, and it really does give you a feel for the difference between the two two experiences that Paul had. Uh, and keep an eye out on SFF website as well. We are in the middle of, of creating some of these footage for, for Scot Scottish um, flood experience as well, so that, that we get different property types and different different voices giving this message. So I would encourage you to have a wee look at that. So in that case, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, again, in the chat function, uh, there'll be some links to some manufacturers, surveyors, installers, or some of these, these measures and some of the organisations that are already very involved and very competent in this area. So we'll leave you that in the chat function. And finally, not, next slide. Thanks, Daniel. So in summary, um, this has been primarily an awareness raising talk uh, to make sure you are aware of, of things you can do and of PFR uh, and why it's becoming more and more important as, as the cl our climate uh, changes. But I'd just like to leave you with a few actions you can take based on all our talks this morning. Do, if you haven't already, check SEPA's flood maps uh, to see if you're in an area that is considered at risk. But also think about heavy, how heavy rainfall could affect your property. As Gail showed in that photo, really heavy thunderstorm, th thunderstorm rain can affect properties that, that may consider themselves not that at risk or not be at the bottom of a hill. Sign up for SEPA's flood warnings. Um, the more you're aware and ready for flooding, the more you have time to to act and take 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 measures that, that can help your property. Make sure your insurance covers flooding uh, and consider a bill about better when you next renew your policies. Have a plan. What would you do if you did flood? What would you take with you? What would you put up high, whether that be on surfaces or, or upstairs? Know in advance what you would do. Just have it on your phone so that it's easy to, to take ac to access. Consider investing in air brick covers or barriers if you really think you're at risk. Um, and maybe get some advice on, on what you could do to your property to make it make water less easy to get in. And also consider property flood resilience measures when you do DIY or you're having home improvements done. Just have a mindset of how can I dry this out, not throw this out. And that's it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Kirsty. That was really, really insightful um, and, and lots of activity and lots of actions that our audience can can take away um, and, and, and and you know put what they've learned today um, into practice and, and hopefully um, you know mitigate against some of those effects. Um, so just to, to wrap up, we have our final uh, poll question today. Um, how likely are you now to consider property flood, flood resilience measures? Um, now that you've heard about you know the variety, um, how to access them, and the you know the effectiveness um, that they can have in terms of um, you know reducing the, those impacts and reducing the time out of your home if um, you know the worst should happen in terms of, of a flooding event. A couple more seconds. Excellent. Um, no, that's fantastic. Um, I think definitely think it's worth looking into, and even just that that initial um, you know insurance policy check is is a really great uh, you know first step just to make sure um, that you would be covered. So next up, um, we have our Q and A. So hopefully, um, you know the presentations from from Kirsty and Gail today have inspired. Um, you to think about this um, as a topic and so if you do have any questions please um, pop them into the chat box um, I'll have a little look just now to see if we have any okay so we do have an audience question here so that is why does an insurance company not insist that the electrics and fuse box is higher and why aren't um, automatic air bricks after a flood fitted, um, you know, as standard? Will flood re and the build back better option cost extra on your insurance policy? I'm guessing that question's to me. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that the uh, it's always two questions, but I'm happy to to take both in turn. Um, I think we are seeing now uh, a she see change with ins in good insurance companies uh, and the majority that we will start seeing those things coming through. Um, they've had 
they would argue, and I'm not speaking for the insurance companies, but I've had these conversations. So their point of view would be they have always had to, their policies have all been re re return a pure property to what it was before. And they had their hands tied that that's what they had to do. They couldn't, um, it was called betterment. They couldn't better a property by, by making changes under the insurance policy. Um, homeowners could choose to do that at their own cost, but the insurance policy mm -hmm. couldn't. That part of the build back better thing is changing that that um, that setup. So insurance companies who sat, who agree to do this this build back better um, mindset can start um, putting in a, a changes those changes. Uh, and certainly the insurance companies that are involved in the climate change and resilience conversation, which is the majority are beginning to go, well, how do we all as an industry start putting these things in the standard? So it's coming, it's slow, um, but it's a, it's a very fair question and is one that is being faced into. Um, we can always ask, because putting higher electrics and higher fuse box shouldn't be an additional cost, we can always ask as an informed consumer, we want that, um, but slowly it's becoming that the surveyor should be suggesting that as well, the, the builder should be suggesting that, the insurance company should be demanding that but we're not there yet but it, it is coming so it's, it's the right question to be asking will flood rate and build back better cost extra for insurance um full flood rate won't flood rate itself has been in existence for a number of years um and if you're in a flood risk area your insurance company may already be deciding to to use a flood rate policy to to be able to offer you flood risk insurance um, so that doesn't and in fact is actually brought for the majority not all there are exceptions but for many people that has brought the cost of insurance if you're in a flood risk area down and made it accessible where it wasn't before build back better may cost a little bit more on your premium so a bit like when you say yes i want to have legal cover on my insurance or with a car policy i want to have a higher car it will I think be an optional, yes, I want this addition and it'll cost me a bit more of my premium. They're still very much working through what that's going to look like, but my suspicion from the conversations is that yes, it's going to cost a bit more, um, which is why I'm saying consider it, not do it. Um, so that's, I think, the best answers I can give, not being a, an insurance company person per se. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Kirsty. Um, hopefully that has answered that question. We do have another um, and asking when will the property flood resilience training course be launched? Um, it's already launched. It's been funded. Uh, it's, the course is being created by SIWEM, uh, which is the Chartered Institute of Water in, and Environmental Managers, um, uh, and they cover the UK. It was funded by the Environment Agency primarily, which covers England um, uh, in the same way SIPA covers Scotland. But their aim is that it becomes the industry standard across the UK. So at the moment, they are piloting it with some of the, their English stakeholders. Uh, we've got kind of hold on a, a pilot in Scotland, um, hopefully in the autumn. Um, and I know they are, last time I spoke to them, it was imminent. So the foundations course is already out and they're, they're taking King's Foundation is very much making sure anybody doing the course is has got a, a common level of understanding of the of the um, flooding the, the environment um, and the others should be available this autumn. Wonderful thank you again Kirsty that's great. Um, I don't think we've got any other questions. Um, oh actually sorry we do have another one here. Um, so given the recent uh, heat waves and changes to the weather that is a kind of warmer um, impact that we're having, should we still be um, as worried about flooding? Um, Gail, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I think I think the thing is, is um, we're, we're seeing climate change can can equally mean that we're getting drier spells and warmer weather. But equally with that, we get the higher risk of thunderstorms, and that brings a different type of risk. It brings that surface water flooding, those high intensity events, rainfall events. If you think, uh, and if you remember actually, um, two years ago this, this week, we in Scotland probably had the biggest thunderstorm event that Scotland had seen in recent memory. We had thunderstorms right up the east coast it caused widespread flooding um 
there was um, the A68 had a landslip and most of the South Carriageway disappeared. There was extensive flooding in, in several communities right across the area from um, Midlothian to um, Falkirk to Fife to up to Aberdeenshire. And actually the, the weather then was partly we had had it quite dry and then we had this really, really intense rainfall. Our rain gauges on one at several sites recorded the most intense rainfall that they had ever recorded and their records had been going for a long time. The air the Fife Airport rain gauge recorded over a month's rain, not just in a day, but in four hours. Now that type of rain is not the type of rain that we're used to having. So yes, we're also at the moment, can we believe Scotland is in a period of water scarcity and we are having to use water wisely, but equally it's it's a bit like that old joke that they used to make about it's the wrong type of leaves on the line with um, railways. We can have the wrong type of rain at certain times in Scotland and we can go from we can be in a drought, but we can have flooding. And that's something that we really have to adapt to. Mm. It's it's the type of rain that personally, I've only really experienced when I've been in much further south in, in the world where we've got warmer tropical climates, but we're getting that more diverse, extensive range. So mm. I'm afraid to say, I think you have to see it both, but I think if you're making adaptations to your home for climate, you might be thinking of making certain changes that can actually improve things for when it's warmer and when when it's colder or to save energy things like shutters um on windows you know keeping the heat in but actually they can keep the heat out in summer and things like that so we have to adapt our homes to all the different climates and i'm speaking from flooding because that's my specialty but equally at the same time we have to think that we're, we're going to have a change in climate and we could have more droughts um, in the future and equally they they won't end with just one flood that's the thing we need to have we need to have the right type of rain for for a, quite a number of weeks and months now in order for our water resources to build back um, up to make us not in a, in a water scarcity position so um, yeah I hope that answers the question no, absolutely. And I think sometimes it is just changing that mindset and think, you know, not associating automatically, you know, dry means no risk. It's that overall kind of extreme way that events are becoming much more commonplace. And that's, you know, right across the spectrum of, of what those weather events could be. Um, no, thank you very much, Gail. It's really appreciated. Um, we have one final question, if we don't have any more from the audience. Um, is there any funding available to help um, protect your property or to, to implement any of these measures that have been discussed today? I'm happy to start with that one and then Gail, I don't know if you've got anything to add. Um, it would depend which local authority area you're in. Check your local authority's website. Some um, do have subsidised schemes or um, bulk buying purchase schemes, so uh, will help you you buy. Not all do, but um, there, there are a number that that uh, already have those schemes in place. Um, so that would be your best port of call to check your local authority. Yeah, and I was just going to maybe add to to that by saying, in in periods of flooding. Um, it is up to an individual homeowner to protect themselves and their property. Um, however, some local authorities do provide some um, emergency um, things like sandbags, although there are much better products on the market now than sandbags, but they do try to um, provide some um, methods to deflect water really and that's where you might see councils using sandbags either to bolster up uh, an embankment or a wall or you might see um, um, what looked like motorway barriers being used in certain locations to deflect water away from properties and buildings and, and keeping it in the floodplain so yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. So um, that's us come to the end of our Q&A session. Um, and it just leaves me um, to thank the audience for, for joining us and for, for sharing those questions. And hopefully you got some, some good answers and insights there. 
thank you so much to the panel um, and sharing your thoughts and, and your knowledge and expertise on this topic um, and for a really insightful discussion at the end there. Um, we have posted loads of links um, in, in the chat um, and if you haven't already, please um, download any of the handouts or, or, or save any of those links before you leave. Um, your feedback is um, really important to us, um, so take a little minute um, to fill the survey out at the end of the session. Um, so, but yeah, finally, thank you um, again for attending today. Um, you know, join any of the links to, to find out more about the organisations um, who have spoken today, um, and also the Green Homes Festival. Thank you um, for taking part in this first webinar of the festival. Um, there will also be a link in the chat to the rest of the events over the next couple of weeks. Um, and yeah, we hope we've got the, the event and the festival off to, to a great start. Uh, thanks again. Um, thanks, Christy. Thanks, Gail. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. And to our audience, um, enjoy the rest of the festival.